this video, we'll explore something called the average rate of change, secant lines and their slope, and the difference quotient. Let's start off by looking at an example. Suppose we were growing a plant. Now the plant starts off small, and at the beginning, it might only be four inches tall, but after a month, it might be 12 inches, then 17, then 19, then 20 inches. If we put this in table form, at the beginning, zero months, it's four inches, one month, 12 inches, two months, 17, three months, 19, and four months, 20. So a logical question to ask would be, at what rate is the plant growing? Or similarly, we could be asking, on average, how much does the plant grow each month? Well, one way to do this is to strictly look at the definition of an average. We're averaging the growth each month. So how much did the plant grow each month? Okay, pulling up our table from before, for the growth over one month, well, it ended off at 12 inches, and it started off at 4 inches, so 12 minus 4 grew 8 inches that first month. Similarly, the next month it grew 15 inches, then 2 inches, and then finally 1 inch. If we average those numbers, we just add them all up, then divide by 4, and we get that it grew an average of 4 inches per month. And while this is correct, this was somewhat of a tedious calculation. We can do better. So another method to look at this is to say, okay, the plant grew a total of 16 inches because it started off at four inches and ended at 20, and four months passed. So if we divide that total growth over the total time elapsed, we would get the same answer. 16 over four is four inches per month. This is a much simpler way to calculate an average rate of growth, and this is the way we'll do it in this class. So let's not do method one, even though that might be more intuitive. Um, we could also look at this graphically, what's going on. So we can do this by plotting points. Um, we'll have time on the x-axis and height in inches on the y-axis, and we'll just plot point by point. Now we could draw a curve connecting these dots and I would expect this to be somewhat of a smooth curve and continuous because a plant doesn't all of a sudden just jump up several inches. It's going to be a continuous type growth. Okay, so if we look at the calculation we did before, we said it grew a total of 16 inches over those four months. So four months is the change in X and the change in Y is 16 inches. When we took the average rate of growth, we did 16 divided by 4. That's just the slope of this blue line that I just drew. Now that blue line, that has a special name. Any line connecting two points along a curve is called a secant line. And this is a very important concept because the slope of a secant line is always going to represent an average rate of change, or in our example, how much um, on average a plant grew each month. Let's look at a more mathy example. Suppose we have a function f of x equals negative x squared plus 6x. Suppose we want to find the average rate of change from x equals 2 to x equals 5, so over the interval 2 to 5. Well, let's draw our secant line connecting those points and find the slope. Um, while we could definitely do the find the slope graphically, suppose I didn't quite trust my picture. What I would want to do is I want to find the y value when x is 2 and the y value when x is 5. Well, I can do that by plugging the values, um, plugging those x values into this function. So f of 2 would be negative 2 squared plus 6 times 2, which is negative, well, 2 squared is 4, so negative 4 plus 12 is 8. So our first point is located at 2, 8. Similarly, the second point would be located at um, 5, 5, because when I plug in 5 for x, I get 5 for y. Purely coincidental. Now we can just find the slope by doing the change in y over change in x. Now if we look here, 5 minus 8 is negative 3, so the change in y is negative 3, and the change in x is positive 3. So our slope would be negative 3 over 3, or negative 1. And if we look at our graph, that makes sense, because when y goes down by 1, x goes right by 1. Down 1, right 1. Down 1, right one. So our slope is indeed negative one. Putting this a little bit more generically, if we look at any curve and we look at two points along the curve, we can connect those points with a line called the secant line. 
And if we want to find the slope of a secant line, it's going to be the change in y over the change in x. Or instead of saying y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, we could say instead of uh, y2, we could say f of x2. Instead of y1, we could say f of x1, because that's the y value when x is 1. So while there's two ways to represent the slope formula, we can view it as change in y over change in x. If you haven't seen this symbol before, that's the Greek letter delta representing change in. So change in y over change in x, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Well, we could write that as just f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. And the second way is the way we'll prefer to write this formula for the average rate of change. We can also express this average rate of change formula slightly differently. Suppose instead that we weren't told what x1 and x2 were. We were told maybe what x1 was, but then we were told just what the change in x was. So let's redefine these symbols. So our first point, instead of calling it x1, y1, we'll call it x and f of x. Our change in x we can call h. Why h? I don't know. That's just what we call it. So our first point's located at x, and our second point would be x plus whatever the change in x is, so that's just x plus h. Now similarly, since um, when x is x plus h, then y would be f of x plus h. So when we relook at our slope formula, instead of doing f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1, well, our second x value is x plus h, and our first x value is just x. So plugging that in, we get f of x plus h minus f of x all over x plus h minus x. But the denominator, you can see these x's cancel out, and we would just wind up with h in the denominator, which makes sense because that is our change in x. So yes, this formula looks completely different and kind of scary, but this really is just a slope. It's the slope of a secant line. It's the average rate of change. When we write it like this, though, we give it a special name, and it's called the difference quotient. So if you're ever asked to find the difference quotient, this is what you're being asked to find. All right, so let's view an example. Suppose we want to find the difference quotient, um, the simplified difference quotient, so we are going to simplify it. Um, for a function um, that's equal to x squared. So recall that our difference quotient is f of x plus h minus f of x over h. When we write our simplified difference quotient, we're going to want to leave the x's and h's in the formula. But we don't want to leave the, f of the f's in the formula. So let's figure it out. Um, well, we know f of x is just x squared. We can plug it in. And h is just h but we do want to find out what f of x plus h is, so let's figure that out first. So if I plug in x plus h into this formula, I would get x plus h, all that squared. Then if I distribute that, I would get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Next, we're going to plug this into our difference quotient formula and then simplify for step 3. So our f of x plus h was x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, so I plug that in over here. Then I'm going to subtract my f of x, which was just x squared, and divide all that by h. Be really careful when you simplify this difference quotient that you distribute properly, that you cancel out terms uh, properly. Just be really careful. All right, so I see here that I have an x squared and I have a negative x squared. Well, those will cancel, and my numerator becomes 2xh plus h squared all over h. I could plot an h and then cancel those h's to get 2x plus h. That is my difference quotient. And again, this difference quotient represents the slope of a secant line or an average rate of change for any given value of x um, and change in x, h. So why are we doing this? If this is just a slope, why are we doing it this way? Um, two reasons. First, that it can be useful for finding multiple rates of changes on the same function. Because now you have a formula to quickly find that slope of the secant line, no matter what x and h are. So we already found 
what the difference quotient was um, for f of x equaling x squared. So let's find the average rate of change over the interval um, from x equals 1 to x equals 3. So recalling that our difference quotient told us the slope was of the secant line was going to be 2x plus h. In our example, the lowest x value is 1. And the differences in the x values, what h is, is just going to be 3 minus 1, which is 2. So plugging that in, we get our slope is 2 times 1 plus 2 equals 4. So that was pretty quick. And you now let's do it one more time. So, okay, same formula for the difference quotient, but this time our lowest x value is going to be 5, and the change in x's would be 8 minus 5, which is 3. So x is 5 and h is 3. Plugging those into our formula gives us 2 times 5 plus 3, which is 10 plus 3, or 13. So this tells us, again, the average rate of change, the slope of the secant line, secant line, <laughs> Um, or, or a difference quotient for specific values of x and h very quickly. All right, honestly, if this is all we could do with the difference quotient, nobody would care about the difference quotient. But really, this is a very important concept in this course. Um, where it's going to be useful is in the next section, we're going to talk about taking limits of the difference quotient when the change in x, or in other words, when h approaches zero, this is going to represent how fast something is changing in that moment over like an instantaneous period of time. Um, and that's essentially going to be the fundamental concepts in calculus, what the whole course is going to be based on. So that's why this difference quotient is so important. All right, uh, let's do one more example of finding the difference quotient for another quadratic function, but this one's a little bit trickier. We're going to start it off the same way. We're going to plug in x plus h in for x. Um, be very careful when distributing. Um, be careful where the negatives are and all that other stuff. Uh, let's see. So let's distribute. So we know x plus h squared is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Let's distribute that negative. Um, in the next step, we can distribute this 5 right now. Um, we still have the minus 2. All right, so distributing this negative will give me negative x squared minus 2xh minus h squared plus 5x plus 5h minus 2. Plugging this into our difference quotient formula gives us, uh, this is our f of x plus h, what we just found, minus f of x, and notice I wrote minus parentheses f of x, because we are going to need to distribute that negative, and all of that over h. In the next step, we're going to distribute the negative, and when we distribute the negative, that just changes the signs on everything in f of x. All right, now we're going to cancel out terms. And a quick note for all polynomial functions, everything in f of x will cancel out with something over here on the left with f of x plus h. So just a quick check to make sure you did it correctly. And when we do our canceling out, we get negative 2xh minus h squared plus 5h, all of that over h. Again, we can plot an h so we can cancel those h's out. And we're left with negative 2x minus h plus 5.